Sam Walton is one of the most important business icons for serious entrepreneurs to study. His name is synonymous with the American dream. From humble beginnings as a small time merchant with only $5,000 in savings, Sam founded Walmart and scaled it into a $400 billion retail empire. When he died in April 1992, Sam Walton was the richest person in the world. But his journey to completely transform the retail industry and in the process make the Waltons the richest family in America was far from easy. In contrast to the typical founder stories we hear about in today's tech-enabled business world, Sam Walton didn't become wealthy in his 20s or early 30s. In fact, he lost his entire business at age 32, was kicked out of Newport, the town where he built his first retail store, and was forced to start all over again, all while being married with two young kids. Now look, I know that Sam Walton and Walmart aren't as sexy to study right now as this Sam, but Walton's lessons are super important to understand for anyone who's serious about building sustainable wealth. He's one of Jeff Bezos' biggest sources of inspiration, and if Sam Walton hadn't written his autobiography while on his deathbed in 1992, there would be no Amazon. In this video, I'll share what I learned from studying Sam Walton and reading his incredible book, Made in America. We don't need the money, we don't need to buy a yacht, and thank goodness we never thought we had to go out and buy anything like an island. We just don't have those lands of needs or ambitions, which wreck a lot of companies when they get along in years. Some families sell their stock off a little at a time to live high, and then boom, somebody takes them over, and it all goes down the drain. One of the real reasons I'm writing this book is so my grandchildren and great-grandchildren will read it years from now and know this. If you start any of that foolishness, I'll come back and haunt you. So don't even think about it. That's Sam Walton reflecting on his frugal lifestyle, something the public often criticized him for. Why was this guy who had built a company with a $50 billion market cap driving around in a pickup truck? Sam would go on to respond, well, what do you want me to do? Haul my dogs around in a Rolls Royce? There's good reason why Bernard Arnault is the richest man in the world and why LVMH is Europe's most valuable company. Humans love playing status games and LVMH luxury goods helps you win that game. In a world where everyone is constantly trying to signal how much money they have through fancy cars, gold watches and designer bags, Sam's philosophy sticks out like a sore thumb. With all due respect, nobody has ever been richer than you are at this moment. I have no money to spare. But that's also why he managed to keep so much of his wealth and pass it on to future generations. He didn't play a status game, he played a wealth game. In his amazing book, The Psychology of Money, Morgan Housel writes, Wealth is the nice cars not purchased, the diamonds not bought, the watches not worn, the clothes foregone, and the first class upgrade declined. Wealth is financial assets that haven't yet been converted into the stuff you see. Walton would probably agree with this wholeheartedly. In his autobiography, he explains that it takes time and effort to make a dollar, so every dollar wasted is like wasting your life. His goal was to hold Walmart stock forever and let it compound in perpetuity. Sounds a lot like Warren Buffett, doesn't it? Well, they both grew up during the Great Depression, which impacted their attitude towards money. What's interesting about Sam though, is that he wasn't particularly motivated by money itself. What motivated him was to be the absolute best at whatever he sought out to do, and he picked retail as the place to leave his mark. When Sam was 27, he bought a small Ben Franklin store in Newport, Arkansas. There are only a handful of Ben Franklin stores left in the US today, but back in the 1950s, it was a leading variety store chain that franchised its concept to aspiring retail entrepreneurs. Sam bought the store for $25,000 using 5K of his own savings and 20K borrowed from his wife's dad. Pretty bold move for someone who had very little retail experience, and especially after being scolded by his former boss as JCPenney who told him, Walton, maybe you're just not cut out for retail. That comment obviously wouldn't age well. Imagine what his boss at JCPenney must have been thinking as he witnessed Sam build Walmart into the retail behemoth it would become. But more importantly, the comment is an excellent demonstration of how little Sam cared about his doubters. This is a common theme we see when studying founders and investors on this channel, which is also why it's so important to do just that. By studying and learning from history's most impactful people, we see patterns, are able to connect dots, and compound our knowledge. Whether it's Elon, Bezos, Buffett, Munger, or Thiel, they all at some point told themselves, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing, I don't care what anyone else says. Sam Walton was no different, and ever since he was a kid, he absolutely loved competing. He writes, If I had to single out one element in my life that has made a difference for me, it would be a passion to compete. It taught me to expect to win, to go into tough challenges, always planning to come out victorious. 
Later in life, I think Kmart or whatever competition we were facing just became Jeff City High School, the team we played for the state championship in 1935. It never occurred to me that I might lose. To me, it was almost as if I had a right to win. Thinking like that often seems to turn into sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This reminds me of Sam Altman and how he argues that we should have almost too much self-belief. When you're done with this video, I highly recommend checking out the video I made about Sam Altman and his success principles. I'll link it up here. Anyway, so Sam Walton makes this bold bet on himself and goes off and buys this Ben Franklin store, right? And remember, he's a 27 year old nobody at this time, but that doesn't stop him from setting big goals. I've always believed in goals, so I set myself one. I wanted my little Newport store to be the best, most profitable variety store in Arkansas within five years. I felt that I had the talent to do it, that it could be done, and why not go for it? Set that as a goal and see if you can't achieve it. If it doesn't work, you've had fun trying. I love that mindset, and it's something I'm trying to adopt more in my life. I think it's common for founders to set big goals and then beat ourselves up for not hitting them. But as long as we're betting on ourselves, it's okay to fail. I'd rather fail chasing my own dreams than succeed chasing someone else's. Well, Sam Walton would fail in an absolutely insane way. After running his Ben Franklin store for five years, he had hit his goal. His store was doing 250K in revenue per year and turning a 30 to 40K profit per year. Sam had built it into the number one store, not only in Arkansas, but in the whole six state region. So what happened? Well, in all his excitement of buying the Ben Franklin store, Sam had forgotten to include a clause in his lease that would allow him to renew the lease after the first five years. And so when his lease was up, he was forced to pack up and close up shop. It was the low point of my business life. I felt sick to my stomach. I couldn't believe it was happening to me. It really was like a nightmare. I had built the best variety store in the whole region and worked hard in the community, done everything right, and now I was being kicked out of town. It didn't seem fair. I blamed myself for ever getting suckered into such an awful lease and I was furious at the landlord. Helen, his wife, just settling in with a brand new family of four was heartsick at the prospect of leaving Newport, but that's what we were going to do. I could read that segment over and over again. Sam Walton is 32 years old at the time and I can't help but smile. Not because of his pain, but because we know how the story ends. I'm so thankful that people like Sam Walton decided to write down their experiences for future generations for us to learn from. This is why reading autobiographies is so powerful. I love hearing the stories of struggle. We can all relate to them. We will all struggle and fall flat on our face, and that's okay. Can you imagine losing five years of hard work to a stupid legal technicality like that? It blows my mind. In his book, A Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl wrote that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. I think about that quote a lot. Despite losing his entire business and being forced to leave town, there are two things no one could take away from Sam Walton, his attitude and his experience. No one can take your skills away, which is why it's so important that we always invest in ourselves. And Sam had learned a critical skill between the ages of 27 and 32, how to make money as a retailer. This would help him stage a comeback that we would remember for generations. Sam moved his family to Bentonville, Arkansas, found a new store and signed a 99 year lease. The goal was to offer steep discounts on some products with the expectation that customers would buy more profitable items as well. The basic discounters idea was to attract customers into the store by pricing these items toothpaste, mouthwash, headache remedies, soap, shampoo, right down at cost. Those were what the early discounters called your image items. That's what you pushed in your newspaper advertising, like the 27 cent crest at Springdale, and you stacked it high in the stores to call attention to what a great deal it was. Word would get around that you had really low prices. Everything else in the store was priced low too, but it had a 30% margin health and beauty aids were priced to give away. Health and beauty products functioned like lost leaders. This is a strategy that retailers use all the time now. Amazon sells Kindles at a loss with the expectation that they'll recoup that investment through profitable digital book sales. Serial entrepreneur Mark Lurie did the same thing when he launched his company diapers.com. He sold diapers at a loss to attract customers. Mark Lurie ended up selling diapers.com to Amazon for $545 million and his second company jet.com to Walmart for $3.3 billion. So the strategy clearly works. So what did Sam Walton do with the profits from his first store? He did what any other wealth driven founder or investor would. He reinvested the earnings and started building a compound machine. Whatever money we made in one store, we put it in another new one and just keep on going. But Walton didn't just accrue all this wealth to himself and his family. He made sure that the people who helped him build Walmart got their fair share. 
The more you share profits with your associates, whether it's in salaries or incentives or bonuses or stock discounts, the more profit will accrue to the company. Why? Because the way management treats the associates is exactly how the associates will then treat the customers. And if the associates treat the customers well, the customers will return again and again. And that is where the real profit in this business lies. Not in trying to drag strangers into your stores for one-time purchases based on splashy sales or expensive advertising. That's excellent and reminds me of what Danny Mayer, the founder of Shake Shack, writes in his book Setting the Table. When ranking the importance of stakeholders in a business, he always puts employees first. If you take care of the employees, they will take care of the customers, who will then take care of the profits and the shareholders. One thing that stood out to me while studying Walton was that he didn't shy away from debt. He was actually highly levered. My family owned the lion's share of every store, but Helen and I were also in debt up to our eyeballs, several million dollars worth. I never dwell on the negative, but that debt weighed heavy on me. If something happened and everybody decided to call their notes, I kept thinking we would be sunk. He clearly wasn't afraid of risk, and he hustled hard to find the right locations to open up a new store. But he didn't just send an associate to scope out a new spot like most of his competitors would. Instead, he got on a plane and did the work himself. I loved doing it myself. I'd get down low, turn my plane up on its side, and fly right over a town. Once we had a spot picked out, we'd land, go find out who owned the property, and try to negotiate the deal right then. That's another good reason I don't like jets. You can't get down low enough to really tell what's going on, the way I could in my little planes. Bud and I picked almost all our sites that way until we grew to about 120 or 130 stores. I was always proud of our technique and the results we got. I guarantee you, not many principals of retailing companies were flying around sideways studying development patterns, but it worked really well for us. Can you imagine competing against this guy? Many founders today are too fancy to pick up the phone to do a sales call, and here we have an absolute maniac flying around in his tiny plane across small town America to close deals. There's no way a guy like that will lose. But if there's one thought I want to leave you with from Sam Walton, it's this powerful sentence. Most everything I've done, I've copied from somebody else. Sam Walton didn't invent discount stores or the warehouse retail model. A lot of the concepts were borrowed from retail pioneer Soul Price. As founders, there's no need to create something completely novel and new. We just gotta do it better than anyone else. There's nothing new under the sun, and that's why it's so important to study the greats. We can live a thousand lifetimes by learning through them. That's it for today. Hope you found some valuable nuggets here. If you did, hit subscribe and help me reach my goal of 10,000 subs by the end of the year. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.